reminder, next Tuesday is the beginning of our Term Project presentation. So we're going to hear from Stephanie Arnold, Emily Bristol, Andrew Chu, Victoria Ibarra, <coughs> Andrew Jager, Sarah Jensen, Preston McLaughlin, and Emily Peace. So I know you're all excited about the possibilities of doing your talk and just wanted to draw that to your attention. That's a week from today. We're going to talk today about... You're going to be great? I know. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to talk today about... I'm really looking forward to that talk about trails in Utah. Ah, yes. That's it. Okay, there you go. So, she's a loyal resident of Utah there. <laughs> So today we're going to talk about LIDAR and topographic mapping and Dr. Tarbiton and I are together going to present this uh, presentation. I'm going to talk about the technology of LIDAR and Dr. Tarbiton is going to talk about high performance computing and com calculating very large bodies of data. Uh, and I should say that um, a number of the presentations that are compressed here were presented at a meeting of the Mapping Sciences Committee of the National Academy of Sciences. I was the chairman of that for a while. And uh, we had a meeting on LIDAR, a new technology developments in LIDAR, and I got some slides from that that otherwise would be pretty hard to find. So the basis of the LIDAR or elevation program of the nation is this thing, which is called 3D, 3D elevation program. And it's part of the mission of the US Geological Survey to do topographic mapping for the nation, and that includes the terrain surface and also rivers and streams, and so those are the two basic things that they consider like their thing, and elevation is critical to that. And <coughs> this is um, based on or derived from the National Elevation Data Set, the NED. Now I remember, now who remembers when there wasn't a NED? Yeah, I remember when there wasn't a NED. Nobody knows that there wasn't a NED, <laughs> but there, there, was, there was a time when there wasn't a NED. Um, <coughs> And so the, national, the idea of the, the NED is that uh, lots of people measure data all over the country, but it all needs to be blended together into a continuous surface with a constant set of specifications of the <coughs> coordinate system, the elevation units, and horizontal and vertical datums. Now, I have to say that um, this is still going on with LIDAR. <laughs> this has been achieved for data of lesser accuracy, but not yet for LIDAR. It's still a sort of work in progress. And there's a national map which we've extracted data from in this class, and one of the themes of the national map is elevation, and the NED constitutes the um, elevation layer of that. Just as a, an aside, um, how did the national elevation data set get produced for Texas? It was done with water money. So about 20 years ago, George Bush was our governor, and we had a bad drought, and he said, Ah, okay, how much water have we got? Uh, how much water are we using? How much water do we need? And every time he asked the question, the response came back, uh, well, good question, Governor, uh, good question, Governor. And so he decided that this needs to be improved, and so a comprehensive bill to improve water planning in the state was passed, um, and that's what led to the development of digital uh, mapping for water management in the, in the state. It was actually an interesting, and so the National Elevation Data Set was produced for the first state in the country was in Texas, and it was done by converting the contours of one to 24,000 scale elevation, uh, of one to 24,000 scale topographic maps into a continuous surface. So that was done eventually, and it was knitted together all across the country. Now what's happening is the idea that it, this is not just about digital elevation models, it's also about three-dimensional data in all forms. So point cloud information, which is what the core information is from LiDAR, is included in that. So there's lots of interesting pictures that you can see. Uh, I've seen a map of New York City with uh, 20 points per meter. I mean, so somebody's yeah, gone, gone and done LiDAR 20 points per meter. You know, a meter is not practically the length of this bench. Tick, 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 tick for New York City. Just imagine the effort involved in doing that. Um, so the idea is then lots of people collect this information, but how do you do that in a consistent form so that everything stitches together normally? 
So central to this is the idea that there are different quality levels, and these are listed here uh, in the LiDAR that, we're, that we've been accustomed to having has a vertical accuracy of about plus or minus 20 centimetres. Uh, generally, uh, data is more accurate on flat surfaces like roads, for example, that are open and not, uh, don't have trees above them and so on. Maybe you can get eight, eight or nine centimetres there. And then in the middle of the forest, it's less, maybe 25 centimetres. So the average accuracy here is about 20 centimetres. And the idea is that this is going to move up to this QL2 level here uh, where the accuracy will be 10 centimetres and this means that you've got two points per square metre. So if you have a box sort of roughly this big then you've got a couple of points in that and you've got that for the whole area. Now Alaska is treated differently. What makes Alaska different than the rest of the country? It's cold, you're right, it's cold. What goes along with cold? Ice and snow, what about up in the sky? Lots of clouds. Lots of clouds. So, uh, LiDAR is a regular light technology, it doesn't go through clouds. So there's another technology called IFSA, which stands for Inter Interferometric Synth Synthetic Aperture Radar. And that radar is a much longer wave ra radiation and it can pass through clouds. And so, Although IFSA is less accurate than LIDAR, it's still um, chosen for Alaska because it can be done regularly and also, of course, Alaska is a huge state, so it's hard to um, develop uh, good mapping there. Probably now, the, it? Yes. What does it do with like, ice cover? It's like if that's shifting all year round, especially. So the question is, what, what do you do about ice cover where ice is shifting all the year round? Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, so I was at a recent workshop, and there was a person from University of Minnesota, um, and he was developing uh, repeat uh, surveys of uh, the polar regions for elevation. And he was actually advocating using uh, the changes in elevation to try and um, study the uh, receding ice caps or uh, building up of ice caps, moving of glaciers and things like that. So there is a, the National Science Foundation Polar Programs is uh, sponsoring his work to gather high resolution, light, well, high resolution elevation data using, I think, the IFSAR technology over the polar regions. In so people are studying this sort of thing. Yeah, and uh, as that just sort of brings to mind, um, there's a developing survey that's being done in California for snow with the same idea. So in other words, if you fly over mountains during the summertime, you hit rock. And if you fly over in the wintertime, you get snow at a certain depth. And so by uh, having repeated overflights you c with LIDAR, you can actually measure snow cover. And so in the last two or three years in California, uh, that's been a mechanism that's been used to assess snow cover in the state. Now there's this other level here, QL1, with eight <coughs> points per square metre, and there's some new technologies that uh, create that kind of information that I'll speak of in a moment. Now, <coughs> when we had the meeting in Washington uh, for 3DEP, it was just really getting started in 2015, and this was the status of the data or of, of acceptable quality three years ago. So the green is considered like good enough. And you can see there's not that much of it in the country. There's some in North Carolina. North Carolina's leads in all kinds of things. Uh, and this is the current status. So now much more information has been collected. Some states even completely. I guess this is Kansas. All done. So uh, uh, what can you say? It's a great country, huh? It's a great state. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you've driven across Kansas in June, but ah, it's a really pretty thing to do. You see all the... They only needed one elevation level. Ah, there you go. <laughs> 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 yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> uh, Kansas is a cool state. You see the wheat and you see the wind blowing in the wheat. It's really cool. But you can see Florida, you know, essentially done. M even much of Texas is now in process which is really a revolution for our state. That about 180,000 square miles of the 270,000 square miles of Texas has been mapped uh, and with the information becoming available this year or next year. 
So that's a big step forward, actually. Uh, still not, of course, national in coverage, but much better than it was three years ago. Now, I mentioned a, another technology that's emerging, and this is called Geiger Mode LiDAR, and Harris is one of the companies that um, has popularized Geiger Mode LiDAR. And the idea is that this is a contrast to regular LiDAR, which is called linear mode LiDAR. So in linear, in linear mode LiDAR, LiDAR came about about 15 years ago. And the essential idea is that you're flying along on an aircraft, there's inside the aircraft a pulse, uh, a pulsing laser. And <coughs> it puts out little light particles, or little light blips, you could say, and they hit a mirror. And the mirror rotates to the left and the right as the airplane flies along. And so the points go and you've got billions of these points. I don't know if you remember Carl Sagan. He always used to talk about billions and billions. There are billions and billions of these points. And the speed of light is so fast that <coughs> compared to the speed of the aircraft, the light goes down, it bounces off the earth and it comes back to the aircraft again fast enough that the aircraft has barely moved in that time. This is so fast. And so it's like and so you're just like ping, 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 like a machine gun, measuring the distance um, to the Earth by the gap in time between when the pulse left and when it comes back. And <coughs> so that's how regular LiDAR works, linear mode LiDAR. And this new version, which is called Geiger mode LiDAR, works on a different concept. In linear mode LiDAR, every individual pulse is like a particle and it's tracked as such. Geiger mode LiDAR is like having your cell phone and instead of, whoops, I don't have my cell phone, but anyway, whatever, imagine my cell phone and there's sort of a, a whole array of beams that are coming out from the different cells in the, uh, in the uh, screen of the cell phone. And the Geiger mode LiDAR is much more difficult to interpret because it's got like a whole set of over, overlapping uh, images but it can measure much more information. So the planes fly higher, they fly faster, uh, and you see the, the information from, much, from many more different angles. So where do you want to fly high and fast and measure things on the ground? Where do you think this technology came from? War. War, yeah, from Iraq and Afghanistan. So this is the migration into the civilian community of technology that was developed by the military. You know, fly high, fly quickly, and measure things accurately on the ground. So linear mode versus Geiger mode LiDAR has some comparisons uh, that look like this. So the density in points per square meter, if it's the same, then the Geiger mode LiDAR can be covered much more quickly. I've heard it said that with three aircraft, you can cover the whole of the United States, United States. In, in one year. In Thank you. <laughs> in one year. Um, so, uh, and also at this meeting, one of the uh, impressions that was being conveyed is that uh, if you think about when LIDAR was originally developed, there was a big jump up from aerial photogrammetry, which is what had been done before that, and then Geiger mode LIDAR is another big step up since that. This is still, Geiger mode LIDAR is still kind of coming into its own. It's not really the standard technology yet, but there's a much more... Um, uh, it, 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 the gap that you saw between 2015 and 2018 would close much more quickly and it's even discussed about the idea that we could actually remap the country every year. I mean, it's, the three-day program is currently a plan to go on for eight years to finish the country once. So with Geiger Mode LiDAR you can fly along like this and as you do that you're looking at any particular object in lots of different ways. So you're actually flying along and this uh, sort of shell beam that you saw before comes out of the aircraft and you see objects from the, from the top, from the bottom, from the left and from the right. And the trick in this is that you have to unscramble all that. So there's a lot of signal processing goes on with Geiger Mode LiDAR and the quality of the result depends a lot on how the algorithms are worked out. So on the left is an example of linear mode LiDAR and on the right is an example of Geiger mode LiDAR. So this is a new technology and there's some new, there are some test cases that are being flown. Uh, here's a, uh, I guess a highway, a set of highways and highway overpasses 
even some cars on that. Uh, here is the football stadium. Go Horns, yeah. <laughs> I was there on Saturday night when, oh, they lost by one point. What can you say? It was a great game, yeah. I went with my grandson for his first ball game, seven years old, so we were teaching him all the cheers songs and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> kind of cute. <laughs> now, one of the people who I really admire in this field, his name is Grady Tool, and he has been instrumental in building the instruments that are used for measuring uh, LiDAR data on the coast. And this is producing topographic bathy, bathymetric elevation models, or called topobathy surfaces. And Grady's at uh, Georgia Tech. He was on the committee. And if you take a look at this picture, your eyes just glaze over. Uh, this is how the coast is described. So there's all kinds of definitions of what the tide levels are. So there's mean high, high water, which is the highest of the high water levels. There's mean high water. There's mean low, low water. There's mean water level. Uh, and the definition of where the land ends and where the sea begins varies from state to state. And these, these definitions depend on uh, where the higher water levels are. And you can see that on the ocean side it's owned by the state, on the land side it's owned by individuals. And so you can, you look at all this and pretty quickly your eyes just, you just think this is complicated. I was the chairman of a panel of the National Academy that was looking into FEMA mapping. And I said, why couldn't we have a single type of athlete surface for the coast? This was like 10 years ago. And I was assured because of this, oh, it's too complicated. It's just too complicated. You, you don't even go there. It can't happen. I said, OK. I mean, the people who were telling me this were presumably more knowledgeable than me, so I assumed that they were right. Um, and in doing a better job, they've got to take into account uh, the idea of the geoid, the ellipsoid, the idea of elevation being the difference between the land height and the geoid height and the uh, orth so-called orthometric heights, which is the height above the, the geoid, which is the correct or most accurate de definition of elevation. Now, what Grady and others were involved with was the idea that if you're on the coast you, and you want to measure underwater, you have to have a special kind of LIDAR, which is actually green. The regular LIDAR is blue. And it, green LIDAR penetrates water better. And you've got to also take account of Snell's law. What is Snell's law? Oh, yes, you just back up in the morning and say, yes, I know Snell's law. <laughs> Snell's law. Maybe you studied this in physics? It's to do with refraction, right? Sazador, you're going to tell us about Snell's law. What's, what's Snell's law, Sazador? Uh, it's something like the ratio between um, I forgot the ratio of sine. Sine of this angle to the sine of that angle, yeah, is a product of the difference in density between the two mediums. So when you've got water to air, the, the sign of this angle compared to the sign of that angle is different than if, for example, this was glass. And uh, you can shine a beam of light at, a, uh, at water or as, at a glass uh, plate, and you'll see that the beam gets bent. So if you're flying an aircraft over water and attempting to measure what's the bottom of there, you have to take all that into account. It's a complicated business. And there are a number of instruments that have been built to do this, and the one that Grady was led the development of is called SEASMIL, which stands for Coastal Zone Mapping Image and Imaging LiDAR. And even the story of how this instrument itself got built was, was really a saga, because they started building it, and then Katrina happened. And the Hurricane Katrina went right over Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, and that's where they were located. And Grady and all his team were wiped out. Their, whole, their homes were destroyed. So they all had to disperse to different parts of the country. And then they come back and they had to decide, you know, we're going to abandon the whole project. And then they decided they were going to continue and they'd fly back during the week and work in Bay St. Louis, or actually inland at the Stennis Space Center, and then fly home in the weekend. His family moved to Atlanta. But I mean, it was one of those, you know, incredibly gutsy decisions to start your life again and start the building of this whole instrument again 
after a, you know, a tremendous um, uh, disaster happened. They sheltered actually in their work facility as the hurricane went over. Now that instrument was contracted for by this lady, her name is Jennifer Wozencraft, and she's in an organization called Jalbatex. That's isn't that a wonderful acronym, yeah, Jalbatex. I mean, you've really got to be a geek to have, a, have an acronym like the Joint Airborne LIDAR Bathymetry Technical Center of Excellence. There you go, Jalbatex. If you haven't learned anything uh, else today, you've learned that. Uh, and what was really impressive to me was that after I had been told that it wasn't possible to build a single topographic basic surface, five or six years later, along comes this lady. You now she's contracted with Grady Tool. They've built the Seas Mill. Oh, she said, oh yeah, oh yeah, we took care of that. Yeah. And so, whoa, look at that. And fantastic uh, imagery that's been produced and now by the, this is the US Army Corps of Engineers. And this is the US Army Corps of Engineers doing what they can do. I mean, this is a really big organization. They've got uh, 36,000, a staff of 36,000, for example, just to compare with the US Geological Survey, which has 3,000. And they can do big stuff. And here they just contracted for the development of the instrument, and then they're measuring the bathymetry of this particular location, which happens to be in Seabrook, New Hampshire, where the Corps of Engineers has responsibilities for coastal works and uh, erosion and coastal uh, beaches and things like that. But you know, what a fantastic um, uh, representation of the information as you can see there. Uh, so Seasmill is applied uh, on a program that's operated by a number of agencies in the country uh, all the time. And these aircraft are different than um, for Geiger mode. They're not flying high, they're flying low. They're flying 400 meters, and that's not very far up, 1,000 feet, a little over 1,000 feet. They're flying low and they fly slow. So this is expensive uh, information to obtain because they can't do it for huge areas. It's got to be done uh, sort of slowly along the coast. And they're uh, collecting information both on the land and also in the water. And this is a really interesting uh, slide because it shows actually what, how they analyze this. So they've got the, the machine gun going and the LIDAR pulses are coming down. Uh, in this particular case, it's coming in at an angle and then you've got to take into account Snell's law and so that the pulses get refracted uh, more towards the uh, vertical. And as they come in, some of them get uh, backscattered from the surface and so there's a a pulse of additional information that comes back from the surface and another one that comes back when the pulse is at the bottom. And so it's by differentiating this pulse from this one that the measurement is made for how deep the water is uh, and indeed where the bathymetry is. And you can imagine you know, how much interpretation it takes to be able to unscramble uh, all of that. But this is some of the imagery that's obtained uh, by doing this kind of a, a measurement. So this is another um, coastal uh, location. This is in Sousslaw River entrance in Oregon. Uh, and this is another one. This is for hyperspectral imagery. What's hyperspectral imagery? Spectral imagery for a start. Yes. Multiple bands. It's multiple bands. And it's in or around the, vis the visible spectrum normally. So that's why it's called spectral imagery. In this case, it says there's 40, 48 spectral bands. And what that means is that this is uh, different than LIDAR. It's just light that's coming up from the yep. Earth. And the intensity of the radiation, in particular radiation uh, wavelengths, is measured. And so by comparing those intensities, you can differentiate one kind of a surface uh, from another. This is Port Susan Bay in Washington. So hyperspectral imagery is also combined with LIDAR and the Coastal Zone Mapping Program uh, has, the, or has the mandate or the goal of being able to reach out 1,000 meters into the ocean and 500 meters onto the land side. Now, this happens to be West Maui, Hawaii. Who's been to West Maui, Hawaii? No, I took my grandson there last, last, last summer, so yeah, actually we were along here. <laughs> um, we, were getting, 
we had uh, we had bog. I don't know if you've seen this volcanic fog. This you know, there's a volcano erupting there, so they had this bog that came over. Um, but anyway, the intent is to develop regional repetitive high resolution in, in elevation information and to be able to do that for management of projects that deal with erosion and sediment control and things of that nature. So this is the progress uh, that's been made and the different colours here represent uh, the number of times that the coastal zone has been measured. So yellow means once, red means twice and so on. And in doing that, what they're doing is they're measuring the actual coastline itself. Now, on our bays, we've got like Corpus Christi Bay and other big bays where the bay comes in. They don't worry about that. They just worry about what goes on on the barrier island along the coast. And so, depending upon the degree of uh, priority, they've measured some of these many times uh, since they got going on this. And there's a website where you can get information on the coastal zone LIDAR, and even some of it extends quite a ways inland. And you can see this extensive information for the areas that are hit regularly by hurricanes. And uh, I picked here um, uh, Puerto Rico, because we've got a project here about Puerto Rico, Preston's working on that. And uh, so there is data available for lots of areas that have come from the coastal zone LIDAR uh, program and also s there's some combinations with inland LIDAR programs as well. So this is an example of uh, digital surface and elevation model and again this is for West Maui in Hawaii and this one shows uh, the vegetation on and the next one shows the vegetation off. So this is called a bare earth model. Uh, so we've got vegetation on is the digital surface model, that's the DSM, and then the, di the vegetation off is the digital elevation model. How do you think that you figure out the difference between the surface and the, and the bottom, the bare earth? Yes, you do. It, well, it's helpful, actually, the, uh, you know, depending on how you do this, that can be crucial. But you can still do it just from the LIDAR itself. How do you distinguish the bare earth from the top of the trees? Yes. Is it reflecting a different amount of light or a different frequency of light? Back? So the question is, it has to do with, is it reflecting a different amount of light or a different frequency of light? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, keep, keep following that line. Yeah. Color. Um, there is, when LIDAR is reflected, a measure of the intensity of the reflection, so compared with the intensity of what went out, there is. That's not the primary consideration, though. There's a lot of interference, that's right, and that's critical to this process. So if you've got leaves and trees, what does that do to the LIDAR pulses? Yes. No, they change. They, the pulses are much the same. They get bounced off like they do the ground. What happens to the time that they take to get back to the airplane? Excuse me? It's faster. It's faster. So in other words, if you imagine now, you've got this airplane flying along and it's going and you're, the pulses are hitting, some of them are hitting the vegetation, some of them are hitting the tops of the trees, some of them are passing through and they're hitting the ground. So what's called the first returns come from high up in the vegetation and the last returns come from pulses that hit the ground. So by knowing the time that they left and knowing whether this pulse is a first return or a middle return or a last return, you can tell whether the pulse hit the ground or not. And so these there's so many of the pulses that you don't need that many of them to get all the way through to the ground, but the way that the, this bare earth model is produced is that it, it is just the last return pulses, the ones that got all the way through. The rest that produce the surface model are the ones, the first return pulses that reflect the height of the vegetation. Now clearly this then provides a mechanism for measuring the quantity of vegetation. It's used in that way in forestry, for example, because you can measure forest cover. 
you have any thoughts on that, Dr. Tarotin? You're, you're up in that area where they have forests and worry about things like this? Um, well, not, not a whole lot more beyond what you, you just said, but there are certainly people who are looking at uh, seeing if they can get canopy structure and that sort of thing out of the, the point clouds uh, that represent, that represent uh, forests. Mm -hmm. So it makes an interesting uh, data model because uh, what we're working with uh, mostly is um, a, uh, a surface, a digital elevation model and a raster. But if you start trying to uh, think of how you're going to analyze this, you can have two surfaces. You can have the first return surface and the last return surface. But really, maybe you want to have the point cloud as the data structure to work with. And that's a set of points in space. And that's a completely different data structure than what we've dealt with in terms of rasters requires different tools and uh, gets you into a whole different area of analysis. Mm -hmm. Now, there is one area where the top of the vegetation surface is what's measured, and that's with IFSAR. So in other words, IFSAR, the interfer interferometric synthetic aperture radar, does not penetrate. It's, it's, a, it's a sort of a, a big swath that comes out it measures the top of the surface. So that's what's going on in Alaska. Um, this was also what was done for the, um, the satellite shuttle radar topography mission that came over the Earth in 2002. And, uh, but Australia did not have a digital elevation model produced like the United States did. They had 250 metre cells. And they got the SRTM data and through a, a backdoor uh, mechanism. They got the military version of it, which is a long story. And the, they spent five years scraping off their vegetation for their country. And they did it with, by using uh, hyperspectral imagery to classify the kind of vegetation that was there, and then the typical sizes of those trees. And so then they didn't have first returns and last returns, they just had this, and they combined it with an interpretation of the vegetation to produce a map more or less like this. And they went from 250 meters uh, elevation data to 30 meters elevation data in one hit. And they produced a new uh, digital elevation model for Australia by doing that. So there's a couple of different methods that you use depending upon the kind of base information that you have. But because uh, if so, it's much easier to do from very high altitudes and also from satellites. Now another thing that we've heard a lot about uh, in recent years is uh, is uh, drones. And so this company called Velodyne, um, they, ca they have LIDARs that are small enough to be on a drone. So this is the person who gave a talk about this. And they've got various different kinds of LIDAR sensors, but they've got this one 3.6 inches wide and 11 inches high, or even 3 inches wide and 4 inches high, little LIDAR units that they can put on a drone. And these are some of the drones that they are using for that purpose. So you can see uh, there's sort of like mini helicopters and there's quadcopters and eight copters and who's flown a drone? Okay, you're brave people. I, yeah, I've flown a drone and I got the control thing right and so and you pull this thing down and it goes boom up like this and I just got nervous about the whole thing. I was afraid I was going to smash up the drone. Uh, but it's really incredible. I mean, what can be done with drones is really amazing. And then the most recent uh, flooding that's happened in, uh, the Flo in Florida and in the Carolinas, there were lots of uh, imagery that was coming from commercial television stations that were measured from drones. So this is be clearly becoming a standard uh, technology now. And here's some examples of the things that Dr. Tarleton was talking about, about the interpretation of vegetation. Now this one is, this picture is taken and it's interpreted using photogrammetry. What's photogrammetry? Piecing together a lot of photos to actually get the characteristics. Yes, piecing together lots of photos. So if you think about drones in the think way we normally think about it, and you think about this thing that flies around and it's got a camera on it, it takes lots of pictures, maybe even it takes video. So if you think about all the images, even like what we have now on phones, I mean we can take video galore, and then you say, I was taking the picture of this thing, if I put all these images together and I correctly interpret the way I'm doing this, I can actually figure out what it was, the three-dimensional shape of the thing that I was looking at. 
because I've taken it from different angles as I went along. So this is an interpretation that's been done from photogrammetry, and then this second here is an interpretation that's been done from drone-based LiDAR, multi-beam LiDAR, and here you can see some of the um, this canopy structure of the trees that comes from the uh, drone-based LiDAR. Uh, and here's a... Uh, oops. Oh yeah, there's a video here, so let's see what we've got here. Oh, look, we've even got music. Kind of cool, huh? Yeah. Um, so you can see, even while they were fiddling around here with the video, just how they can capture the leaf structure and uh, structure of grass and so on. It looks like from that slide, um, you've got uh, the that was software that was looking at the point cloud. Yes. So the it was looking at the, what's referred to as the LAS file or LAS file. Uh -huh. um, so right at the end of the video there. I don't know if you can get to the end without having going through the whole thing. Okay, let me see what I can do here. <laughs> Whilst well, it's not that important, is <laughs> Yes, yeah, so, the so there you can see that it's a quick terrain modeler software, and you can see there's individual points, uh, thousands or millions of them, and they're, they're each colored with probably something that's related to the uh, reflection intensity and uh, your eyes are effectively filling in the structure that you're seeing there. Um, yes, that's true. And so LAS is a standardized format for LiDAR that was developed by the um, American Society for Photogrammetry, Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing. And it's a standard for development of point clouds or conveying point clouds. Now, point clouds are incredibly large data sets. DEMs, you may think, are larger. Point clouds just dwarf. DEMs. So being able to convert the point cloud into an elevation model is really helpful for getting the data down to a smaller point. Now another reason that uh, LiDAR has been used, or even topographic bathymetric LiDAR has been used, is to uh, think about ecological flow needs. So you, you want to study rivers and imagine how deep the water is and how fast the water is flowing, and that affects the habitats of eels and dwarf mussels and river otters and weed and trout and all kinds of things. So the US Geological Survey and other organizations are doing Tupperbathy LIDAR for this kind of habitat studies. And this is an example of uh, an, a river, I think it's in Delaware somewhere, anyway in the northeast, where this kind of study has been done. And Earl B means a particular kind of type of athy LIDAR instrument that was used for this particular mapping. And here you can see that this is not, um, this is not the coast, this is a river uh, inland. And so they've flown along the river and this is uh, an example of the topographic and bathymetric uh, solution here. And I think that's, yeah, that's the last, last of these slides. And uh, so a goal going forward now is to take the concept of the coastal Tupperbathy LIDAR and to be able to bring this all the way inland. In other words, to have a single Tupperbathy surface for the nation which would measure the bottom of all the rivers and not um, just rely on the fact that the, when we do this kind of work we see the, the top of the water surface. And Dr. Tarpeton is going to be going to a meeting at the National Water Centre in a few weeks to discuss this. Do you want to say anything about that? Um, well, I guess I've still got to learn a little bit about what the meeting's about and prepare a presentation. Um, but I think they, yeah, they're looking at uh, the. It's a, it's effectively a meeting of people interested, uh, mostly the federal agencies, trying to uh, 
look, at, look towards the next uh, opportunities in the next generation of uh, integrated uh, topography and bathymetry. And the reason we're going, and both of us got invited, and I guess uh, Texas students are presenting term projects, so I'm going to miss the class here, is how we chose who's going. Um, because of the, the hand method and the need of, of hand to have high resolution information on the um, bathymetry of the channels to really, uh, to really be of benefit. Yes, so our, when, when we started with hand, it was this was sort of the mental image of this is really what's going on here. And so we want to be able to take all of that information into account in developing inundation mapping, and it's, as you were trying to do in, in exercise five. And so this is an attempt um, to say you know, this is the direction the nation should be going. Now, I don't know how long it's going to take to get there. It took less time than I thought for the coast to be done, so perhaps we can get the Jabal Tech's people to fly inland a bit and do this as well. So at this point, I'm going to quit and turn over to Dr. Tabberton, and he's going to talk about work that he's done in to how to process all this information in uh, high-performance computing. Okay, so... Um I think we saw a slide like this before, uh, where we were really motivating the, uh, the idea that as you get higher resolution data, you have to uh, deal with uh, much larger data sets. Um, and uh, you, there's sort of been this progression of where you start from uh, 90 meter resolution data, and now we're getting down to uh, where you've perhaps got one meter resolution data. So that gives you a huge increase in the amount of data you have to process. So if you're dealing with uh, a digital elevation model, you're trying to analyze uh, your watershed, this is at the same time an opportunity and a challenge because you've got to fit that on your computer, you've got to uh, have software that can deal with it uh, and all those sort of things. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of uh, what we've done, maybe perhaps it's just scratch scratching the surface and then think about uh, the challenges as we go ahead. So the next slide talks a little bit about uh, Taudem. So if you're taking the, the Taudem software, which is quite similar in some ways to the um, software that you've worked with in ArcGIS in terms of uh, watershed delineation, if you're applying it, uh, first you need some sort of expertise in, in what it does, hydrologic DEM analysis. It's hard to get around that, although we're trying to make it uh, really simple to use with the, uh, the toolbox tools that then uh, describe exactly what it does. You need the software, so you may need some sort of a license. You need the ability to install the software, and sometimes installing the software has been challenging because of uh, the things it depends on. Uh, it might depend on uh, either a Windows platform, if you're trying to put it on a Mac or Linux, uh, it's, a, it's a problem. Uh, it uses parallel processing uh, capabilities, so that sometimes is a problem. You need, an, you need sufficient uh, hardware, so that's where you've got to have the RAM and disk space to work with the data, and then you need the data itself. And as we get to these larger data sets, that's also becoming challenging. So this is all motivating moving towards uh, server-based or cloud-based deployments of the capability for people to use to do the analysis. So let's go to the next slide. And I think this shows uh, there's an organization called open topography um, that has, it's funded by the National uh, Science Foundation, and they're the organization that is hosting and making available uh, LIDAR data that comes <coughs> from the National Center for Airborne Laser and Mapping. That's what NCOM stands for. Um, and you can go to that website, and you can say, okay, this is the watershed that I'm interested in, and I want the LIDAR data for this area. So uh, the connection to this with, with our work in hydrology comes through the idea that, okay, they said, well, we can just deliver the LiDAR data, but then what are you going to do with it? It's maybe too big for your own computer system. Uh, maybe you don't have the expertise to have to run, uh, run TAUDEM. So uh, there was a collaborative project where we basically said, okay, can we run TAUDEM on their system and instead of just delivering LiDAR data, either in point cloud format or as a bare earth image, can we also do the, the TAUDEM processing to do that? So let's go to the next slide. Um, so uh, that uh, 
was in part motivated by the work that had been done to enable TAUDEM for uh, working in parallel. So this shows the general strategy where you've got a raster and you divide it into slices. Here I'm just showing it divided into three slices for illustration, but typically you divide into a lot more. You uh, deploy it on a computer that's got a capability to run multiple processes uh, using parallel processing, and it basically processes each stripe independently. So it's kind of like you've got uh, eight graduate students, and you tell them each to do analysis on part of the area, and you have to stitch it all together. Well, now I'm giving it to eight computer processes, and they're each working independently. Then they have to process sort of one row on either side of the buffer to ex use it to exchange uh, information. And that lets you get your results more quickly, and it also lets you uh, run larger problems because you can run them more quickly and you can uh, effectively spread the burden of holding the data in, in memory across your processes. So I've got a couple of slides to talk about how the pit removal process works uh, through this. Um, so uh, the way pit removal is, is done, at least in Taudem, as we use this uh, algorithm with, uh, plan from Planchon and Debeau, that says uh, you've got a digital elevation model, and the black line and the little diagram to the left might represent the original digital elevation model surface. And here I'm showing it in two dimensions, whereas it's something that's really in three dimensions. Um, and uh, the, you, so you can imagine the, uh, the two little dips in the middle, those would be internally draining sinks if we just had two dimensions. So we try to fill up the elevation. The way this algorithm works is it first initializes everything to a really high elevation, above uh, the highest elevation in the area. And then it uh, has a sort of pass across that starts from the left and says, is there an elevation value that's, um, ca can I lower this elevation value down to either the value of the grid cell where the data is or to the elevation of the lowest neighbor. So you imagine if you uh, sort of passing across from the right to the left in the first pass, um, for all of the first uh, set of cells, uh, the guys in Texas won't be able to see my mouse here, so I'll, I'll sort of des describe it going from, uh, you, you lower it down to the original elevation, but then as soon as the terrain starts going down, now the lowest point is the neighbor. So you end up, uh, representing that first flat step. And then you go up uh, and you're capturing the original elevation. And then when you're lowering to the lowest of the original cell itself or the neighbor, you build this next flat step until you get to the end. Now you do it again, but you approach it from the other side. And the second pass effectively uh, does the same thing coming from the left-hand side this time, and you end up building that step. If our terrain surface was just two dimensions, you'd now be done. If it's three dimensions and you can have the water actually flow out in the north-south direction as well as this cross-section, you have to iterate until things stop. So um, if we go to the next slide, this, uh, this shows how we uh, do that in uh, the sort of parallel approach. So you divide the domain into three parts. Um, and you set that process going on, on each part independently. So you have this traversal that uh, goes from the top left uh, to the bottom right independently in each slice, independently in each process. Um, and it's got this uh, sort of rule here that's uh, specified in uh, this uh, sort of outline of the code that says to do for all the grid cells in the domain, if the elevation is greater than a neighbor, um, it uh, lowers the value, then F is the new value, to that elevation. Otherwise, the new value is uh, taken to the neighbor, and it puts it on a stack, because if it has not lowered it to the new elevation, it's a candidate for being lowered again. Um, and then it ends that loop uh, after it's gone through all of those. Um, then it does uh, communication. It, this is where it shares information across the boundaries. So there's a number of commands here send the top row to the next process up above, send the bottom row to the next process down below. That's what rank minus one and rank plus one means. And then receive the row from above, receive the row from above, below, and then do it until it's not modified. So then it'll do the processing 
back uh, in the other direction, now just working off the grid cells on the stack. So that's the sort of uh, logic that we have to uh, work into the pit removal function to implement it in parallel. And if you go to the next slide, so this showed, as we, we started this work in uh, 2008, uh, there was a, I had the version of Taudim that was out at that point was uh, the version 4 that used a single processor. Uh, the biggest grid size we could deal with was only 0.22 gigabytes, which isn't very big when you think of the, the high resolution LiDAR data. So we sort of went through various uh, implementations where we uh, got up to the theoretical limit of the file format we were working with, uh, which was about four gigabytes we were, were able to run on, on eight processors. And then we got to uh, where we uh, switched to sort of different file formats. We uh, started using 64-bit uh, computers rather than 32-bit computers. And then there's no theoretical limit. It's just whatever your, your hardware can support. So this sort of shows if you're dealing with a 10 meter DEM, and we put this uh, together over the Chesapeake Bay because uh, the Army Corps of Engineers is funding it and uh, sort of having it centered on where the, uh, the Pentagon was and uh, show you can show bigger and bigger areas outside of, uh, outside of that, enabling the, the capability to work uh, with larger areas. So the, go to the next slide. Um, so we also, so that was effectively uh, work on just improving uh, TAUDEM working on our own uh, local computers. But Open Topography was uh, hosted at San Diego Supercomputer Center that was part of the EXCEED organization, which is a National Science Foundation uh, network of computers to effectively provide um, uh, really sort of extreme high performance computing capability to the, to the research community. And they've got a, uh, one of their programs is extended collaboration services. And they helped us with uh, improving TAUDEM to work with even larger data sets and uh, streamline the input output, writing to multiple files at the same time to be able to, uh, be able to run over, over large data sets. So uh, this, this slide shows um, as, you, as you were, well, it shows different, uh, different programs and the time in, uh, in thousands of seconds uh, when you're running on 256 processes, when you're running on 512 processes, running on 1,000 processes, uh, so you get the times uh, down. We were, we were looking at where were the bottlenecks? Were the bottlenecks actually in the computing or the reading or the writing of the data? And we got to pretty quickly where the computing was no longer the bottleneck, it was the input and output. And often just the reading of the data takes longer than, than the computing when you spread it out over thousands of, uh, of cores. So let's see what's next. So then that uh, was deployed as part of the open topography uh, software stack. So now if you go to the open topography website, you can actually find uh, down there that you can find, you can use Taudim and you can say, I want the hydrologically correct DEM with the pits filled. Um, I want to use the infinity flow directions. I want to use the infinity specific catchment area. And I want the topographic wetness index. If we'd done this a little bit later, we would have also thrown in a uh, height above near a stream. But uh, this was done before, before we uh, started working, working on that. So you can now select uh, these options. And you just say, that's what I want the processing for the area that you've selected from the uh, open topography uh, LiDAR data holdings and submit and uh, they'll put it in their queue uh, a short while later you get an email and says your work is done click here to download uh, the data so go to the next slide so, the, so this illustrates the uh, the downloaded job results where you can download uh, all of the individual results. And this particular one uh, took uh, 600 seconds or so for the Eel River. So let's see what's next. So this is the sort of thing that, that you could get. You could get for the area that I selected, uh, you got uh, the wetness index. The wetness index is the ratio of uh, 
slope to, or contributing area to slope, which is used in, hydrograph in hydrology to um, help identify areas that are likely to be uh, saturated or not. Um, and uh, it's really interesting to look at these sort of these figures and see the sort of the the smooth and as well as the the convergent areas in the topography where uh, where water may accumulate or may not accumulate, where you may get uh, saturation and uh, you may be able to model model runoff. So let's see what's next. Um, so this, I think I showed this before when I was talking about uh, the high-resolution topography and some of the Taudian capability, but this was also produced uh, using open topography for, the, for an area of the digital elevation model up near sort of Teton Pass near the, near the Grand Tetons. So this was actually a, a road, and there's a little hiking trail uh, that's next to it, and uh, you see incredible detail, and when you calculate contributing area from D infinity, you can see how it's following down smoothly following the, the slope of the topography um, and telling you something about where the water's flowing, how it's accumulating, and then you could use that uh, in uh, modeling the runoff uh, or whatever it is that you might be interested in. So let's go to the next one. So uh, then we started uh, working with uh, the National Supercomputing Center at Illinois. They had actually... Uh, been been helping with the, the touting work uh, for deploying on on open topography because uh, it turned out the um, the extended collaboration support services staff person that uh, was assigned to help with touting was uh, Yan Liu who uh, worked with Xiaowen Wang um, at University of Illinois and they said all right they're they're really interested in this and they're helping uh, with uh, some of this work. And then when we got to um, trying to implement hand across the, across the country, we identified that one of the bottlenecks was actually a signing of the, the D-infinity uh, flow directions. And they worked with uh, Cornelius Sevilla, who was an uh, undergraduate student working with them. And he took the algorithm that uh, I had coded up. And I guess you can see this is... This would show me off as a, not a very good programmer, uh, because by identifying some uh, sort of clever ways of uh, doing the parallel processing, he was able to get it to be 250 times faster than the, the way that I'd initially calculated it, uh, coded up several years ago based on a paper that I'd read. And that was an important improvement to allow us to be able to run this, uh, run this over the whole country. Um, so I think the next slide just shows the probably the hand map that uh, you've seen before that really represents the calculation of height above nearest drainage uh, using NHD plus streams uh, that uh, was, uh, was run in parallel at uh, University of Illinois. Um, they, in fact, uh, used uh, the USGS six-digit hack. So you've got uh, the sort of two-digit regions, the four-digit subregions, uh, the eight-digit uh, basins, but in between that, there's a six-digit area. Um, they chose that as the, the area for processing and effectively subsetted the DEM for each of those six-digit uh, units, created a little bit of a buffer around the edge to uh, allow for uh, the sort of, to avoid the edge contamination problem, then processed each of those independently, so that allowed you to have lots of parallel processes going at all at once. And then with any processing of each, there was uh, individual, there was a level of parallelism in running the, the touting programs. And uh, they produced this, uh, this hand map for the country that's uh, now used to uh, look at flood inundation. Can I so I think few, I've just got a, some, can go I, ahead. Can I make a few comments here, David? So uh, this was a, a huge innovation. And just to give you a sense of what's involved here, so the, the, the deep blue colours represent areas where uh, if you come up a certain distance from the height of the stream, that the water spreads out a lot. But, so if you see the Mississippi embayment here, which is where the Mississippi um, River goes up into Arkansas and Tennessee, 
Uh, you can see the same thing in Florida, along the coast of the Carolinas and so on, and also here in Texas. So there's almost a um, geomorphological feel to the hand map for the nation. You can also see these white areas here in Appalachia and also in the uh, Rockies where when you come up a certain distance, uh, you, don't, you, you have to come up a, a big distance before you can go out at all. And so the, the differences in topography are apparent. Uh, also in central California there, there were, there's a central valley. Um, there is here covered about uh, 3.2 million miles of streams and rivers, 3.2 million miles. And the cheapest way that you can do inundation mapping by the conventional method, which is using HECRAS and desktop computing and so on, even if you just do it without any field surveys, costs about $500 a mile. So if you take 3.2 million miles and you multiply that by $500, that result comes to uh, $1.6 billion. In other words, if you were to construct flood mapping across the whole country by conventional methods using desktop computing, that cost is $1.6 billion. And we succeeded here in the second time this was done, May 29, 2016. How, how long do you think it took us to do this, to do the whole country? One day. The whole country was done in a single day. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and if it had been processed by desktop computing, even just using the same functions, it would have taken seven years or something. I mean, they made a, they made a calculation of that. But when, you, but when you start to think about that, the entire high-performance computing budget of the National Science Foundation is about two or three hundred million dollars a year. This single application paid back five years of the entire HPC budget of the, uh, of the National Science Foundation for the whole country, you know, including the TAC and Illinois and all these other places. So this, what's emerging here is a, an incredible economy of scale. So what's possible is uh, thinking about floods and flood risk using the same kind of methods that you've been using in class, like exercise five, right? This is exercise five done 2.7 million times in a single day with high performance computing. And as, now we did this with the 10 meter national elevation data set, and what we're now uh, working on is to um, for Texas to do this, all the same stuff but at the LIDAR scale because it's 100 times denser so that we can't use six digit arc units to break the whole process up. But I think you can get a sense from this about the, the, the lifting of technology from desktop computing to high performance computing and what that can mean. And there's a tremendous economy of scale that's implied by uh, a number of uh, uh, factors here. Now, for Texas, we've spent 15 years doing conventional floodplain mapping and we've got about a half the state done. It's cost between 50 and 100 million dollars to do that. And now, there's a new atlas revision come out called NOAA Atlas 14 that's increased the amounts of rainfall that occur in an extreme storm, or well, the estimates of them, and it all has to be done again. Now that's not a very good business model. I mean, we spent 50 or 100 million dollars on something and now we've got to go and start doing it all over again. And it's all got to be done in you know, a one reach at a time and so on. So, What's, been, what's happened here is really the establishment of a new floor or a new um, foundation, you could say, for how things will be, will be done in the future. And you know, this is not for me, this is for you guys. You know, this is the new generation to take over here. But what you're being given is a, is a, a point of departure for your life and your, well, your career if you participate in this kind of work, but uh, that's comparable to when computers were first introduced. I remember when f computers were first introduced. You, know, you may think that's back in history, but I was there. And <laughs> a long time ago. And I remember just how fantastic it was. I wrote a program for um, doing a gas elimination solution of a matrix inversion or something. And I was just fascinated by the way this thing worked. And it's so logical and all. You know, we, we went over to the computer center and we gave in our card and we got a result. What's happening here is something like that. There's a huge step up that's happening here. It enables the conception and the execution of problems at the national scale that have never been treated at the national scale before. We've always done hydrology from the bottom up, you know, from one watershed at a time or one reach at a time and so on. Now it's possible to think about hydrology from the top down. And I, I think this collaboration with Jan Liu and the uh, University of Illinois and Dr. Tarbeton and so on is a fantastic uh, achievement. In fact, um, 
Jan Lu came down to my retirement function and he, he had this map uh, printed on a, you know, uh, uh, like on a, uh, on a picture. And, and it's mounted in a frame so I can put it on the wall. <laughs> I've got this picture at my home now. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, want, I just want to just toss that out there for those who, who plan to continue on with this kind of work. Um, there's an opportunity to really change things up here for you know, a, a completely different future than we've had. Now, of course, when you do that, there's a challenge, right? This is a complete, this is a right turn compared with conventional technology. There's lots and lots of people who know how to do things conventionally, completely comfortable with that. So another responsibility that's incumbent on us and Dr. Tarbot and myself and others who are involved in this is education. We've got to go out and we've got to educate people and we've got to explain what all is going on here. And that's why the exercise that you've just done has been important because it meant that we could take this process which we've already executed and which was used during the Lano flooding that I talked about in class to deliver maps to Texas about what was going on. This, all this information is now at the National Water Centre and is being published out and delivered where there's a big river flooding. So this is not like, you know, this was just a theoretical exercise done in a university. It was, these maps were being used and used for public safety a couple of weeks ago. Um, so this is the kind of work which, uh, you know, if you, you've got to sort of expand your mind a bit to get in, involved in it, but uh, where you can start to think about and work on and improve the quality of the representation of the whole continental United States and the, and the processing that can be done on that. You know, this is uh, not a ch I'm, I'm going to be a person who's standing on the sidelines and, you know, uh, applauding and cheering everybody on. It won't be me that does this work anymore. But, um, but, you know, this is, when I think about when we started off this work four years ago, we, we had no idea that this was possible. We didn't have any conception, right? So we went from zero to things that were being d deployed during actual floods in four years. And, and the high performance computing and all the technology and methodology that Dr. Tarleton is describing was crucial in pulling this off. Well, so much for my speech, but anyway, I wanted you to... No, I, I feel a sense of passion about this because, you know, this... I think sometimes we, we have the feeling that, you know, all these high technologies are just there for people to do clever things for, you know, who knows what purpose. But here something clever was done for a very simple and practical purpose and to be able to scale up to the level of the whole country what you've been doing in your, uh, your exercise five for your one little watershed in Onion Creek, right? Exactly the same thing but done 2.7 million times over. And one of the benefits of that is that it is automatic, right? Now, it can be automatically wrong, right? It can be, there can be problems. But the fact is, it's not being muddied up by, you know, person one did this, and person three did that, and person six did that, and all oh, this other company did it differently, and oh no, we're, we're, you don't have that. When, you, when you've got a whole national system built like this, it's uniform. Yeah. And if you want to improve the algorithm, then you just do it all over again. And it's all being done automatically. There's something really important about that. And I think also the concept that this is being done on terrain processing, you know, this is, this is what computers do well. They do large numbers of dumb things really quickly. And this is a, a really good example of that. And I want to express my appreciation to Dr. Tarleton for all his uh, creativity because it was all the energy that he had spent over the years to build up and sustain the research that he was just described to you that enabled us to pull this off. You know, I was sort of standing at the distance and saying, uh, we need to have the National Elevation Data Set in one place. Uh, we need to have Taudem or something that will operate on high-performance computing. And, da -da -da. and just all happened that all those things fell together and poof, you know, and, and it happened with some uh, quality improvements, as Dr. Tarleton was pointing out, to make the algorithms run faster. Um, but to me, this is a, a really outstanding example of the benefits of high-performance computing um, that can deliver practical results in a systematic way. Okay. Help. What, we're, what we're now... Um, I'm going tomorrow to talk with the chairman of the Texas Water Development Board, and the, they have a mandate from the legislature to do water planning, flood, sorry, flood planning for our state. Now, I'm not quite sure what that means, and I guess I'm going to find out tomorrow, but um, you can't do flood planning for Texas as a state using desktop computing one little watershed at a time. It's just too expensive. You can't do that. So you've got to find other ways of doing this so that you can do it in a more effective way. Uh, as a result of Harvey, uh, some of our politicians are saying, Harvey's the new benchmark. Uh, Harvey's, well, okay, Harvey's the new benchmark. It's easy to say that. You know, the aspirations of politicians are easy to state, but there's no technical mechanism right now to translate that into any practical procedure for actually saying, how high should this house be built on this stream? It's one thing to say, Harvey's the new benchmark. It's another thing to say, 
How do I translate that into a mechanism for planning new development and redevelopment and reconstruction of places that have been damaged uh, by Harvey? And I think these kinds of technologies and this level of uh, sophistication is what's necessary to do that um, on, a, um, on, a, on, on a large area basis. You know, anything can be done for small areas. You can, you can beat yourself to death on that. But you can't do large areas without this kind of an approach. Well, sorry for my passionate speech, but anyway, that's the Okay, way well, that's actually great. Um, so I think the next slide is the last one. And this is a bunch of uh, boring words. I managed to keep it to five words. <laughs> uh, um, that say some of the same things, uh, perhaps uh, maybe a little bit differently. But uh, in terms of summary, what uh, at least a little bit that I presented at the end here was that LIDO extends our ability to use high-resolution surface data in GIS-based hydrologic analysis and modeling. So we are uh, going into a brave new world. Uh, perhaps when we got DEMs for the first time, that was one brave new world. But LIDAR DEMs at a much higher resolution are a new brave new world. Um, it challenges our uh, computational platform capability. Uh, you can't uh, do it all as, as much on the desktop, so you have to think of uh, cloud computing, supercomputing, uh, and the world of uh, the way we do things uh, computationally uh, is changing rapidly. I mean, uh, we often collaborate with uh, with Google Documents, so those are things that are uh, held in a in a Google Cloud someplace. We don't really know where they are, but we can work together on them. Next time, I'll be telling you about HydraShare, which is the system you're putting your term projects in, and some of the sort of design of that for uh, promoting collaboration uh, where the data is all held in the cloud in the sense of being not on your desktop but somewhere else for, uh, for you to access so that people can collaborate. Um, the, you need software enhancements. Uh, I guess there's a software enhancements are needed to work with large uh, data sets. Uh, so uh, left out the keyword needed in that, uh, that, that, that bullet. Uh, methods need to be adapted. So one of the things that, uh, that I do actually worry a little bit about, I mean, we've done a lot of, we've sort of done the easy, low-hanging uh, fruit, if you will. Uh, we've adapted software that exists, uh, developed for sort of 10-meter DEMs, 30-meter DEMs. We've been able to run it over large data sets. We can run it with one meter data, but as you deal with higher resolution data, I think we need to uh, rethink what it actually means. The flow direction from one grid cell to another grid cell probably means something at 10 meter scale. If you're down at one meter scale or even uh, half a meter, a third of a meter, a few centimeters scale, now that flow direction may take on less meaning because you're dealing with the sort of individual bushes and trees and rocks and things like that. So the sort of digital surface model versus the bare earth model, you need to think about that. So the, the methods will need adaptation. And that's where there's a lot of opportunity for innovation, because uh, I don't think it's just uh, the computational science aspect of it. There has to be the, the physical science modeling. So I guess the last point here, server cloud platforms are needed to enable access, mitigate the local computation limitations. Uh, uh, if you can run the software on a cloud platform that's already got everything installed, nobody ever has any compatibility problems with Google Docs because it's all over there. Whereas people do have compatibility problems with Microsoft Word, WordPerfect, word processors on desktop computing, you have compatibility problems, cloud platforms, effectively the, the service provider takes care of installation, takes care of configuration, takes care of compatibility, takes care of, it depends on this uh, library or that library. Um, and it can also take care of uh, capacity. Um, the, there's, there's large, uh, there can be large uh, storage things. So, so those are some of the things that um, we are getting uh, pulled into, uh, both as opportunities and challenges in working with, uh, with LIDAR data and GIS and hydrology. So I think that was all that I had. Do you have any more you want to say before we declare victory? 
Well, actually, I'm declaring victory on my expository career. That was my last <coughs> expository lecture. I, I started on the 1st of September, 1980. So, yeah, since... <laughs> 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 that was partly why I gave my, you know, from, from the heart speech here, because it's my last chance to do that. So, anyway... <laughs> Uh, Dr. Tabaton will continue on next semester. So. Thank you.